Does Laputa's rule work for this? We have the limit as x approaches 1 of absolute value of x minus 1 over x minus 1. You know, this is actually a great question because even though I've been teaching calculus for like over 12 years, I have never thought about this right here. Even though I have solved this kind of limits before, but I just did it with the piecewise functions. So let me tell you guys this. Laputa's rule does work for this, but unfortunately, it's not useful. Let me show you. First, let's just do, do the usual thing. Let's plug in 1 into all the x's. So we get absolute value of 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1. On the top is absolute value of 0. On the bottom is 0. And this is not LOL, this is absolute value of 0. So you get 0 on the bottom is also 0. When we're doing limits, if you get 0 over 0, we cannot draw any conclusion yet. This is in determinant form, which tells us that we have to do more work. It's nice because we can actually use Laputa's rule. So let's go ahead and proceed by differentiating the top and also the bottom. And to get intuition of why Laputa's rule works, you guys can check out my other video for it. Link will be in the description for your convenience. So this right here becomes the limit as x approaching 1. On the bottom, the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. Nice and easy. But on the top, how do we take the derivative of an absolute value? Well, it depends on how you want to do it. You can do this piecewisely, but let's not do that. I'm going to show you how we can do it more analytically. So if you take the derivative of absolute value of x minus 1, it seems that we can, right? But here's one little note for you guys. Remember when we have square root of x squared, when we simplify this kind of things, we don't really just get x, but we actually have absolute value of x because you have to ensure that the output is never negative. Let's look at it backwards. When you have absolute value of x, let's square it and then put it inside of a square root. So we can look at this as taking the derivative of square root of x minus 1 squared. The benefit of doing this is so that we can use the, the usual derivative techniques, power rule and also the chain rule. Have a look. Taking the derivative of the square root, okay, we get 1 over 2 square root of the inside, which is just this right here. We have x minus 1 squared. And then don't forget to use the chain rule. The derivative of this, well, we have this to the second power, Put a 2 to the front first, times this, raised to the first power. And then technically, we should also be looking at this and then do the chain rule again. But the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. So if you forgot to do this, lucky you. Anyways, right here, 2 and 2 cancel. I'm going to put that on the top. And I'm going to put this on the bottom. But notice, this is just what? That's just the same as the absolute value of x minus 1. So the top is x minus 1, on the bottom is absolute value of x minus 1. In fact, we get the same situation, right? But let me actually show you though. When you have this kind of things where the insides are the same, it really doesn't matter where you have the absolute value. If you stop right here, it's fine. But I can also multiply the top and bottom by absolute value of x minus 1, you will see that on the top, it gives us x minus 1 times absolute value of x minus 1. Now, here's the fact. Square root, sorry, absolute value of x minus 1 times absolute value of x minus 1, which is absolute value of x minus 1 square. And now, for this right here, absolute value of x minus 1 square, I can look at the absolute value part as what we did right here, which is the square root with x minus 1 square like this, and then we square that, right? And this square and that square will cancel. So in this case, in fact, you don't need the absolute value. You can just write this down as regular parentheses with x minus 1 and then square. Now, this and one of them cancel, you just get the absolute value of x minus 1 over x minus 1 back. 
In my opinion, this is slightly better because it's the same as the original, which is pretty cool. But anyways, though, this right here is going to be on the top here, which is absolute power of x minus 1 over x minus 1. And then when you divide it by 1, guess what? You get back to the original. Like exactly the same thing. So, yeah, I actually have never thought about this before, of using Lapidot's rule to do this. So, if you ask, does Lapidot's rule work for this? Well, technically yes, but does it help? No. So does it really work? I <laughs> think you can let me know. But how exactly do you do this though? Well, check this out. And this is what I would recommend you guys for dealing with the limit with an absolute value. The key is to break it down into piecewise definition. When we have absolute value of something inside, well, we can take out the absolute value, but we just have to consider pieces. We will just get inside back, but that's only when the inside is non-negative. But if the inside is negative, then we will have to negate the inside so that we can really force it to end up non-negative. And notice, I put the equality right here. But it doesn't really matter because if you have the equality of the zero here, negative zero, it's the same as zero. But usually we just put here. Now, for the absolute value of x minus 1, this right here is just going to give us either x minus 1 as how it is, but that's only when the inside is greater than zero or equal to zero. But we will have to negate that if the inside is less than zero. Now, one more thing, because right here we will have to divide it by x minus 1, right? So the last piece I want to show you is this, absolute value of x minus 1. Well, have a look. If I just have this piece, that's exactly what we have, right? So that's negative x minus 1 if, let's just add 1 to both sides. So we have x is less than 1. And then right here we have this, which is x minus 1 if x is greater than or equal to 1. But right now, we will have to divide this by x minus 1. So let's just go ahead and do the same thing here and right here. Well, if you look at this, in fact, you can reduce that. It's just going to give us negative 1. If you look at this and reduce that, you'll just get positive 1. And here's a small catch. Because we're dividing by x minus 1 here, x can no longer be 1, so I will have to get rid of the equality here. So just keep that in mind. But for limits, we don't care about when x is exactly equal to 1 anyway. So now, we have this piecewise function. When we have a limit as x approaching 1 without any plus or minus, technically, we have to do both directions. So we will have to check both. First, we check the limit as x approaching 1, let's do the left-hand side first of the function. This means x is a little bit less than 1, right? Well, if x is less than 1, the function is actually just going to give you negative 1. Therefore, this limit has to be just negative 1. Huh? And then, if you have the limit as x approaching 1 from the right-hand side, So now, x is bigger than 1, which is the second piece. This function will actually just give you 1. So we have the left limit and also the right limit. But unfortunately, these right here are not equal. Therefore, we are going to conclude that the limit as x approaching just 1 of absolute value of x minus 1 over x minus 1. This limit does not exist, and that's it.